Well, hello, I'm Josh, and I'm back once again with another movie to tell you about. And today, I have a film that's unlike almost anything else I have ever seen. I'm talking about Samuel Fuller's 1963 surreal mystery, Shock Corridor. Shock Corridor follows reporter Johnny Barrett, who, intent on solving a recent murder in a mental hospital, fakes his own insanity so that he can go undercover and catch the killer from the inside. Once there, Barrett begins interviewing each of the patients, grasping only pieces of information before each of the witnesses fall back into their psychosis. And with each step into the madness around him, Barrett edges closer and closer to unmasking the killer. But in doing so, he soon discovers that he is also starting to lose his own grip on reality. So as I said, this film was written and directed by Samuel Fuller. And though nowadays he may not be a household name as far as famous directors go, he's had a huge impact on other filmmakers, and between his writing and directing, has very much cemented himself as one of the most unique voices in cinema. And before he made his films, Fuller traveled the country as a reporter, writing on all the things he would see on his journeys. Everything from union strikes and race riots to Ku Klux Klan meetings. And while on the road, Fuller also wrote pulp novels on the side, though rarely credited as he did many of them as a ghostwriter. And this eventually brought Fuller to Hollywood as a screenwriter, which he was pretty successful at. But when the US entered World War II, he quit his job and enlisted up with the 1st Infantry Division, better known as the Big Red One, and was even part of one of the first waves at Omaha Beach on D-Day. And these experiences, traveling the world, meeting all sorts of people, and actually engaging in real combat, really shaped how Fuller perceived the world around him. And because of this, when he did get his chance to write and direct his own films, he would often fill them with very diverse casts, uncommon for the period, and talk about very controversial subjects that most other filmmakers were afraid to touch with a 10-foot pole in those days, such as guns, racism, poverty, misogyny, patriotism, and the media. But instead of taking the routes used by other filmmakers, such as Stanley Kramer, who was also known for telling these types of politically conscious stories, his more in the form of straight dramas, Fuller's films were known for being hard-hitting and often action-packed. They focused on telling good stories with complex characters that let the audiences come to their own conclusions rather than tell them exactly what to think. And they weren't all war or western or gangster films by any means, but Fuller was a reporter and so he designed all of his stories to really grab your attention and keep you hooked. And Shock Corridor certainly fits into this tradition. Like many Samuel Fuller movies, it is in no way meant to be subtle. And as the title suggests, the film was a huge shock for people at the time, as Fuller intended it to hold up like a mirror to America each patient representing a different aspect of American society. Things like racism, nuclear weapons, the Cold War, and more are all represented here as witnesses the reporter interviews in the hospital. Now you may have noticed this film has a bit of a low budget, kind of pulpy exploitation element to it, especially if you were to look at any of the film's advertising. And some of that low budget feel comes from the fact that this was actually one of the first independent films that Fuller made outside of the studio system since his smash hit from over 10 years prior with The Steel Helmet. And though his films never had huge budgets, he had already gotten to the point where he was working with big studios like 20th Century Fox, RKO, Columbia, and Warner Brothers, with major stars ranging all the way from Barbara Stanwyck to Rod Steiger, and frequently shot in CinemaScope. So now working independently again, while on one hand he had much more freedom and final cuts, he was given much less time and money to do it. As a matter of fact, he shot this film in only 12 days, primarily on some very simple sets made for the hospital that were visually enhanced through a few simple tricks. The main hallway of the hospital was supposed to feel like it went on forever, though that obviously wasn't possible given the budget and the studio space, so they instead painted a wall with a forced perspective image of the hallway, which appeared to make the set continue much farther than it actually did. Fuller then had a few little people move around in front of the wall in the background, so that at a glance it appears that the people are farther away than they really are. 
a trick Billy Wilder had actually used a few years earlier in his seemingly endless office building that he had created for his film The Apartment. And to fix the problem created by the boring blank hospital walls, which under normal conditions look relatively cheap and don't photograph all that well, they used heavy shadows, often created with the help of shaped metal cutouts known as cookies or gobos to help break up the background and improve the visuals at a very low cost. And these shadows could then be further exaggerated to create a dreamier feel. And I should probably mention the cinematographer on this film was none other than Stanley Cortez, who shot some absolutely beautiful looking films including The Night of the Hunter, The Magnificent Ambersons, along with Fuller's next film, The Naked Kiss. Cortez created some of the most powerful images in cinema, though he was also known to be a very slow worker, actually getting fired off the set of The Magnificent Ambersons as well as Chinatown due to him slowing down the productions. So knowing this, it's a bit surprising to find out that he was able to do a movie this fast. But I guess given the low budget, he must have known that there was only so much he could do in the little time he had. Regardless, both of the films he made with Fuller have some absolutely breathtaking shots in them, making it clear to the viewer that the person behind the camera knew exactly what they were doing. And what Shot Quarter doesn't have in budget, it more than makes up for in style. Given the context of the film being set in a mental hospital, Fuller uses this setting as an opportunity to really manipulate the reality. The very nature of the compositions and the flat sets and sometimes the flat lighting um, adds to this um, psychological and emotional uh, atmosphere which is unbearable at times and you wouldn't have had it with a lot of money. And as you have probably noticed, the movie is by no means going for realism in terms of what actual mental illness is like. As I said, it's instead a much more stylized look at America. The idea actually first originated as a script Fuller wrote back in the 1940s called Straight Jacket, which at that point was written as a much more straightforward look at the awful conditions in mental hospitals, with none other than Fritz Lang actually wanting to direct. But when that fell through, he sat on the script for over a decade, and after being inspired by writers like Samuel Beckett, who shaped their own reality within the theater of the absurd, and seeing the panic around him from the growing tensions of the Cold War, he turned his script into the film shock corridor as we see today. And though as unrealistic as many aspects of this film appear to be, its main premise does stem from real events. In his autobiography, Fuller said that back when he worked for a newspaper in the 1920s and 30s, reporters were known for doing all sorts of crazy things for a scoop, including hiding in a funeral home overnight, and the basis for this film, pretending to be crazy so that they could get put in a mental hospital. And this is really an interesting aspect of many of Samuel Fuller's films. They always have this mix of fact and fiction. They can be both big and over the top while also being incredibly subtle with how they get things across. They can be gritty and realistic one moment and then totally ethereal and dreamlike the next. You never know where the story will go except that it will be exciting. And this film is certainly that. So now to move on to the cast, this film stars Peter Breck who does a great job as the reporter Johnny Barrett. He was mostly known as a character actor playing Doc Holliday in the TV show Maverick, but here he really goes all out, bringing a ton of energy to this role, especially as his character begins to slip further away from reality. Constance Towers is also great as Barrett's girlfriend Kathy. She too was in a lot of shows and films, including a couple of John Ford movies, as well as later starring as the lead in Fuller's next film, The Naked Kiss. And another great actor here is Gene Evans, who plays Bowden, the nuclear scientist. Evans was a longtime collaborator with Samuel Fuller, appearing in several of his films. And if you think he looks familiar, you may also be recognizing him from a film I talked about a few months ago, Ace in the Hole, where he played the deputy sheriff. James Best is another classic character actor you may remember. Here he plays a soldier who defected to the communists in the Korean War but you may also know him from popular TV shows like The Dukes of Hazzard and The Andy Griffith Show, as well as great movies like Sounder and one of Samuel Fuller's previous films, Verboten. I also need to mention Harry Rhodes, who gives a really chilling and memorable performance as one of the first to be integrated into a previously whites-only college, 
only to break under the stress and now imagines himself as one of the racist clan members who attacked him. Rhodes was also in a number of classic shows and movies, including Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, Coma, and a small recurring role in the streets of San Francisco. And last but not least, I also want to mention Larry Tucker, the opera singing Pagalici who often brings some much needed levity to the film considering how dark it gets, while at the same time also bringing along some edge of his own. You may remember Tucker has actually come up on this channel before in my review of the Christmas film noir Blast of Silence. And overall, those are pretty much the only films he acted in. So if you're interested in seeing Shock Corridor, there are a number of ways you can watch it. I believe the film's in the public domain now, so you can really find it all over the place, but in varying degrees of quality. It's also available in a bit more reliable quality from all the usual streaming sites as a rent or buy option, as well as being available on the Criterion channel and Max. And yes, as you can see, the Criterion Collection also made a very nice physical release for this film. The artwork for the box is very cool. It's got this really kind of comic book graphic novel quality to it. And if you look at Criterion's release of Fuller's next film, The Naked Kiss, you can see they were drawn by the same artist, so that's kind of a cool thing if you want to get both of them to put on your shelf together or whatever. They, they both kind of match up pretty well. But even aside from just how great the movie is itself, I think this disc and the booklet just give you a really great introduction to who Samuel Fuller was for those who don't really know that much about him. And so for my question today, I am wondering, what is your favorite film that is allegorical? And when I say that, it doesn't have to be a straight one-for-one -one allegory, but maybe what's a film you like that has multiple meanings to it? You know, saying more than just what appears on the surface. It may sound odd to say it, and most films won't be quite as in-your-face about their symbolism as something like Shock Corridor, but honestly, most good films do this to some extent. I mean, for example, The Lord of the Rings can actually be seen as nature's war with industrialization. And though Tolkien said repeatedly that it was not an allegory for World War II, there are a number of similar themes between his stories and the war he did fight in, World War I. And another interesting example, George Lucas actually said that elements from the original Star Wars films were meant to represent the war in Vietnam. So put some of your other favorite examples in the comment section down below and start discussing. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and subscribe if you want to see some more of these. Remember to keep watching movies and I'll see you again soon. Such a sour note, John. <laughs> you are way off key. So